Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Dwayne, for leading us in, in communion. Uh, can I say a prayer before we get into the message this morning? God, my Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your love and for your voice that you speak to us and guide us. God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you open our ears, open our hearts for your voice to be led by you. In the name of Jesus, amen. A mother stands on a crowded subway platform. Her purse is strapped safely across her chest. In her right arms, she holds a paper bag filled with groceries. All the necessary ingredients for a delicious spaghetti and meatballs and garlic bread and salad dinner with her family. It's her son's favorite. Although, truth be told, the salad is mainly for herself and for her husband. This is no special occasion. It's just a regular Tuesday evening. They'll cook together. They'll eat together. They'll play a game together or maybe watch a show together. A Western, maybe. Her son really likes Westerns. Oh, sure, she'll have to clean up afterwards, but she doesn't mind. She knows that her son will get better at cleaning and also better at avoiding the messes altogether. He is only five years old, after all. Spending time with him is, is what matters most. Showing him how to do things and, and why we do things takes time. So giving him a chance to, to make his messes so that he learns it takes patience. After all, no one wants their kids at any age to get hurt or to live in filth. The thought of her son being hurt grips her heart. And so her left hand grips his right hand all the tighter as they shuffle together through the crowd to approach their soon arriving train. Amidst the throng, a young man watches and waits. He sees just ahead of him a few individuals beyond, a mother and her son. Her arms are full, her hands are occupied in a poor purse that's worn but unprotected. The man slides forward, drawing a small, easily missed pocket knife. The knife severs. The purse's strap, which falls with the purse and is snatched by the man. She instinctively drops her groceries and pulls her son close as she exclaims, Thief! Thief! Some hear her and look around, trying to see either who is screaming or who is fleeing. Seeing neither, they go about their business. The boy, shocked by the sudden commotion, jerks his hand free from his mother's grasp. Mama's upset. I want to help, he thinks, as he darts around and away from safety. No, come back, she shouts, but the din and emerging chaos drown her voice. The boy can't hear her pleas. Shout as she might, search as she does, the boy seems lost within the crowd. Dear church, will you listen for God's voice? Not just to his voice, but for his voice? Will you crave his words, living on more than bread alone? Will you strain for his whisper or quake beneath his shouts? Will you turn both your intention and your attention toward his words, his will, and his way? Will you listen with more than your ears, but turn your hearts and your minds to him? 
Laura, I'm going to use you as an example. I'm going to use our ladies as an example. Okay. So many times we get caught up and say, I haven't heard the audible voice of God. God's not talking to me. We have ladies here who have never heard an audible voice and they know that God is talking to them. There are more ways to listen than with your ears. More ways to listen. Will you listen to God? Will you listen for God? Or perhaps it's better asked because many do have the desire to hear God, but we simply lack the necessary discipline to tell his whisper apart from all the other voices. Will you learn to discern and then practice the truth of discernment? Will you filter the world out to let God in? In short, dear church, maybe the question isn't if you will listen, but to whom will you listen? First John chapter 4, verse 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. The voices you hear are many. Now, not all spirits echo the words of God or are sent by God to convict the world and draw us into eternal life. Not all spirits are those who put voice to those spirits. Encourage fellowship with God first, fellowship with other believers second, and a beckoning relationship with others to come from the darkness into God's waiting arms. So we're told to test the spirits, to discern their motives, for their motives reveal their hearts. The voices are many. And they're not just many, but they speak to us in in various ways, through various forms. For example, commercials don't sell us products. I don't know if you've ever spent time watching the commercials to try to figure out what they're actually selling you. Commercials don't sell us products. They sell us sex, status, friendship, security, power, peace, joy, and wealth. Dear church, that list can go on and on and on and on in perpetuity. Now on the surface for commercials, the motive is greed. If you'll buy the hope for security and status, you'll buy the truck built to last or like a rock. A deeper motive is this. If you believe the truck gives you security, what need is there for God? If you'll buy the desire for friendship and acceptance, then you'll buy the drink, take the drug, eat the food, and purchase the ticket to happiness, just like everyone else. And if you believe friendship and acceptance requires those things, then what need is there for fellowship? What need is there for fellowship with God or with one another? They sell us on their politics, too. And I know, I know, I've been told many times, I'm not supposed to talk about politics. And you're not going to get my political opinion from the front because it's my political opinion. But the fact is this. The political voices and the spirits behind them are some of the absolute loudest in this age, especially in an election season. And I feel like we're always in an election season. Regardless of which side of the aisle that you stand or sit, we like to think that our political way is the way or that our candidate is the hope for America. Of course we do, because none of us in our right minds would hold whatever political positions we individually hold if we thought they were wrong, right? So we tune into the voices that echo our thoughts. We tune out in anger the voices that don't. If we'll buy this candidate over that candidate, then our kingdom of eagles and stars will be saved by one, but destroyed 
by the other. That's the hard sell, regardless of which side of the political aisle you stand. This is a voice of the world, and its deeper motive is this. If you believe your government is your great protector and provider, then what need do you have for the kingdom of God? Dear church, this world, this country, this state, this village, this family needs discernment. Like I said, I have my political beliefs, and likely they sound a lot like many of yours. But the kingdom of God breaks down the political parties, not upholding one or the other. And when it comes to commercials, I, I have my easy sells too. Show me a juicy burger being eaten by a beautiful woman and my heart and my belly want that burger now. <laughs> Gluttony and lust aside, I am sold. I buy the lie I feed the corporate greed and I spend the next hour bloated and lonely knowing the digestive result will keep my beautiful bride away for quite some time. <laughs> our friends and family add their voices to the mix too. Some of them encourage our sin in order to justify their own. The spirit behind that says, God doesn't let you have fun. This is fun. Do this. Some voices persuade us of on one worldview over another. Not unlike Job's friends when Job sat in the ashes and mourned. This spirit says things like, God doesn't care about you. This is all your fault anyway. Or it declares all religions as equal. So just choose one or not at all. Curse God and die. However, some of our friends and family earnestly want to see us grow in faith and in God. Their love for you is born from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit says, you are loved. I'm going to say that again. Dear church, you are loved. Not because of what you do, but because of who he is. You are loved. So crush, oh Christ's love to others. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And in him we have eternal life. Dear church, 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 through 3 says, This is how you know the Spirit of God. This is how you discern the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. That is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. Even now, it is already in the world. Discernment begins with belief and confession. It begins with faith in Jesus Christ, that he is both fully human and fully God. That's the linchpin. If someone or something teaches that Jesus Christ was only a man, then they deny God and his merciful sacrifice. If someone or something teaches that Jesus Christ was only God, appearing as a man, then they deny the common ground that we have with our Savior, and he cannot stand, therefore, in the gap for our sins. If someone or something teaches that Jesus Christ was neither a man or God, a myth made up by people 2,000 years ago, then they deny their need for a Savior and walk in the darkness. Dear church, this is why it matters what voices we let in. Any company, any entity, any politician, any preacher, any teacher, any boss, any friend, any family member, etc., 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 that does not stand for and on the divinity and humanity of Jesus Christ and his love is motivated from a place that denies Jesus Christ as Lord, wanting to persuade you that you need them more 
then you need fellowship with God. The spirit of the Antichrist is motivated to destroy our fellowship with God, to convince us that Christian fellowship is unnecessary, optional. The spirit of the Antichrist wants to blind you to the shackles and the hooks that the world has sunk deep into your soul. 1 John 4, 5. They are from the world. Therefore, what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. Dear church, those spirits, those voices, they want to convince you that life is hopeless. So take pleasure in what you can now. They make you question your assurance of eternal life. They make you doubt whether God's love is actually big enough for you and all of your sin. Well, let me tell you, if God's love isn't big enough for you, then he isn't God. Because your sin would be greater than his capacity for love, forgiveness, and redemption. But he is God. He is greater than your sin. And he loves you out of death, into eternal life. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, you can be assured of eternal life. Don't doubt it. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you will desire his voice above all the other voices. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you will live on earth in such a way that reflects his love to others. His words will be on your lips like sweet honeycomb. His desires, his will and motivation will be your motivation. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Dear church, seek to discern his motivation because where the fruit of his desire grows you will find his presence. 1 John chapter 5, 10 through 13 says, The one who believes in the Son of God has this testimony with himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. This testimony, this is the voice of good news that has been spoken over you to you and is in you. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. The Greek word for life here is zoe. This is different from the other Greek word for life, which is bios. Don't confuse the two. Bios is the maintenance of life. Consider our word biology, the study of life. Does biology look at the quality of life? Does it look at vitality? Does it look at the spirit? Does it look at what brings us cohesively together as a people? No, it studies the body, how the bodies interact with one another, how they interact within the environment, how they are maintained. Bios is the maintenance of of life. You and I are alive. We breathe, our hearts beat, blood flows. We are biological. And a day will come when our biological life will cease, but not our Zoe. Zoe is our vitality, our quality of life, our living soul. It's the fullness of life active and vigorous. It's the thrill you get when your heart beats after a run or when you stand on a mountaintop and survey the beauty of God's creation. Or the feeling I felt the first time I realized I was in love with Sarah and my heart broke and cracked open. Eternal Zoe. Dear church, God has given you eternal Zoe, life. And this life 
is in his son, Jesus Christ. The world has to deny Christ because the world has fully accepted death. It will sell you on a false life, a half-life. But you, dear church, don't take the bait. Remember, 1 John 4, 4 says this, You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And then in verse 6, we are from God. Anyone who knows God listens to us. Anyone who is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. The world wants to divide us from God, wants to isolate us from the body of Christ and convince us that momentary happiness is superior to eternal joy. But God wants us to have life, eternal life, Zoe life in fellowship with him, in fellowship with each other. Dear church, 1 John 5, 5 begs this question. Who is the one who conquers the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Again, the first step in discernment is faith in Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, you can discern truth from deception. Through Jesus, you can walk in truth away from deception. Through Jesus, you can show others truth, rejecting the world's deception. Many of us come to faith. We believe in Jesus Christ, but we still struggle to discern. The voices are many. We're busy asking God the wrong questions rather than seeking what motivates him, seeking to see his desire produced in whatever we do. Dear church, his motivation, his very nature is the filter that we need when all the voices of the world strike us. That filter is love. Not love as the world wants to define it. The love of God, the love that we share with others, desires God in our lives, desires to worship and honor God, desires God in in others' lives as well, above all else. Desiring to grow in God for ourselves, desiring godly growth in others, this is what it means to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. 1 John 4, 7 through 8, dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. God gets to be the one to define what love is, not the world. Love is the first fruit, the first indicator that God is guiding us in fellowship with him. If someone or something is not first motivated by faith in Jesus Christ because of his great love, then there is a root from the world. 1 John 4, 17. In this, love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also we are in this world. As he is, so also are we. So what is he? He is alive. And his love for us calls us to life. The world wants to keep you, me, all of us in darkness, dead in sin, convinced that God isn't big enough for you. The world echoes the spirit of deception. And anything of the world, because it is not God, does not love you. It despises you and Christ in you because the presence of his eternal life in you is a constant reminder of the death that the world has so greatly wanted to ignore. 
If the world can't tear you down, it will therefore distract you with other quote unquote loves. The world is a street dealer selling knockoff valuables at a cheap price. It says, buy this, love this, and you'll look like you've arrived. Buy that, love that, and no one will know your weakness. God says you are enough. He is enough to complete you, to restore you, to give you eternal life and life to the fullest. Dear church, just as John concludes his first letter in chapter 5, verse 21, guard yourselves from idols. Idolatry robs God of love and it rejects his love for you. The world is full of idols. Some are obviously dangerous and others can appear quite innocent. All are deceiving if they are born in the world, not founded on faith through Jesus' love. So guard yourself from idols, from the, the many spirits that want your allegiance and attention. Have confidence in your faith that it connects you with eternal life by Jesus' love. Discern the spirits through the filter of God's love. Finally, back to the story of the mother and the lost child. I'd love to wrap it up and give you a clean, happy ending but I won't. In fact, I won't tie it up at all because the truth is, is that that story could go in many different ways. Some with hope, others with broken hearts. Maybe the boy realizes he's lost the treasure he ran after. wasn't worth the cost. Maybe he stopped and searched for his mother's voice, but Maybe not. The truth is that God, our Father, is calling out to us amidst the noise of the world. He wants to spend time with us. He cares for us. He wants fellowship with his adopted children. But we're often too busy adding to the noise, taking what we want, chasing after this thing or that thing to hear him and return to his loving embrace. So what happens to the boy who doesn't return? It's the same thing that happens to all of us. Broken and raised by a world that doesn't love us or hurt and destroyed by a world that absolutely despises us. But you, dear church, take faith. Take faith because Jesus is calling your name. And in his pierced hand, he offers eternal life. So let him mend the world's woundings, all the, all the barbs that have been spoken into you and over you. Let him take them out and fill your mind and your ears and your heart with his voice. Let him mend the world's woundings by his great love. Will you listen to his call? Will you seek his heart? Will you let him show you the way? Respond to him as we stand and sing.